and welcome to Sophie and Co. I'm Sophie Shevardnadze. As ever more terror groups pledge allegiance to Islamic State, the local conflict in Syria and Iraq is spreading far beyond the region's borders. How far can it go? And how do you stop the growing popularity of ISIS? To discuss this, I'm joined by FBI counter-terror veteran, Vice President of the Sufan Intelligence, Martin Reardon. As the spread of Islamic State is finally being countered on the ground, all over the world extremists swear fealty to the terror group. What attracts people to the black flag? How did the ISIS brand grow to such prominence? And can the onslaught of hatred be resisted. Martin Reardon, former FBI agent, counter-terrorism expert, vice president of the Sufan Intelligence Group. Welcome to the show. Great to have you with us. Now, Islamic State originally pledged to create a caliphate, take over Syria and Iraq. But now that all the terror groups are joining ISIS in Libya and Egypt, Afghanistan, Nigeria, will we see all of them under the Islamic State flag, like one big terror organization? Well, I, I think it's... It, this is the big debate right now. There are a number of uh, extremist groups, terrorist organizations that have uh, a sworn bait or allegiance to uh, ISIL. There are other ones that uh, have given their allegiance to Al Qaeda. And as we know, ISIS and Al Qaeda, same ideology, but a uh, very different way uh, and goals. Um, I think what you have seen in the last several weeks or the last few months is an expansion of the ISIL brand originally in Iraq and Syria, it moved on over to the Afghan PAC region, into the Philippines, uh, into uh, Libya, uh, into Egypt, and of course, most recently, the declaration of an emirate uh, under Boko Haram in Nigeria. We're going to talk about Boko Haram. It's funny that you used the word brand. Has ISIS made itself into the coolest terror brand that young extremists want to be part of? Was that the idea? Well, I think a lot, a lot of the, the you know, the, the term branding used, uh, it, 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 what ISIL is trying to do is to recruit heavily from all over the world. And, and this is this brand. And as, as macabre as it is, as brutal as it is, there is a niche within the extremist community worldwide that finds that very appealing. Uh, and which explains why they do the, uh, the, the videos of the executions uh, and, and whatnot. Boko Haram has done the same thing. And it's, of course, recently where uh, they've sort of adopted some of the ISIL uh, videography uh, techniques and, and putting their uh, videos online. But the two groups, and I'm talking about Nigeria's Boko Haram and the ISIS, they're, um, they're far apart. Geographically, at least, Boko Haram was focused on the destruction of the Nigerian state. Is it now trying to boost its image outside of the country with this ISIS allegiance? What for? Well, I, th I think what you see with the the recent allegiance between or that Boko Haram has given to ISIL, it, it benefits both entities. For Boko Haram, it gives them the prestige of no longer being looked at by the world as a small uh, insurgency within Northeast Nigeria, but they're part of a much larger organization. And as they say, it's part of the caliphate. Uh, so it's that prestige for, for Boko Haram. Um, it's also a quick fix for them. This was done conveniently uh, just weeks after the major offensive by Nigeria, by Niger, Chad, Cameroon, which have really in the last few weeks taken back probably a few dozen uh, of the cities and villages there that Boko Haram had firm control over for a so number of do months. Do you think ISIS will help them out? I mean, send them weapons, money, soldiers? No, I, I mean, again, you're talking a distance of close to 4,000 kilometers. It's, so it's not going to be uh, uh, assistance by ISIL. It won't even be direction, probably, by ISIL. But it, it's that brand. And, 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 and uh, Abu Bakr Shekel was very clear in this. Uh, in his uh, videotape message where he was swearing allegiance to ISIL it is calling for uh, my brothers, uh, other Muslim extremists in Africa. If you can't get to Iraq and Syria, come here, emigrate, was the term he used, to Nigeria and fight with us. So this is, this is in part to uh, bring in fighters from outside of Nigeria. The, the vast majority of the uh, Boko Haram fighters um, are from the... Uh, the, the tribes or the ethnic group, the kind of ethnic group there in uh, northeast Nigeria. So bring in fighters from outside, 
bring in weapons from outside. You recently said the issue of radicalized extremism has risen to a never before seen level of violence and geopolitical instability. Why have decades long international efforts against terror failed? I think for a number of reasons. And first and foremost, you have to look at when it comes to terrorism, regardless of whether it, it, uh, it, it's religiously driven or politically driven, but it, it's like politics, it's local. So wherever you have terrorist groups come up, it's local issues that, that bring their rise. Um, I think all too often, um, the governments have uh, looked at this problem of terrorism as, as, a, as a nail, so to speak, and, and their only tool to fight it was a hammer. Or, or you know, if, if, if your only tool is a hammer, military force, then every problem is a nail. In the last couple of years, there's been more and more discussion on addressing the root causes of extremism, and that's where it gets to be political. Uh, the reason somebody is driven to extremism in Nigeria is different than the reason that they're, they're brought to uh, extremism, say, in London or in New York, in Islamabad, uh, or in, uh, in, in, in uh, Syria. And so it's addressing these root causes. But if extremism stems from local trouble, why is anti-Westernism the main recruitment narrative right now? That is with the uh, Islamic extremists. Um, and, 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 and that is, when you're looking in the Middle East, when you're looking in Africa, and, and, and let's, let's go back to Boko Haram. Uh, there are two big things that they oppose. One is the westernization of Nigeria. Nigeria, for uh, more than a century, was a colony of, of the United Kingdom. Uh, and, you know, there's a fairly significant Western influence, particularly in the South. Uh, so there, there are anti-Western sentiments there. The same in the Middle East. Much of the Middle East was controlled to one extent or another by different European powers. There are a lot of anti-Western sentiments there. And when you're talking about people who may be very poor, they feel as though they are disenfranchised, um, perhaps uneducated, uh, that, that's not fair to say. There are a number of educated uh, extremists as well. But disenfranchised and poor, they look at somebody to blame. The West, they, they think, in a large extent, is to blame. Okay. In the Middle East, arbitrary lines that were driven to create countries. But look at the Middle East. You're talking about countries being poor. Middle East has always been poor, and there's always been social problems there. But terrorism has flourished only in the past 50 years. Why? I think part of what you're seeing is uh, starting in the 1960s when uh, a number of these countries in the Middle East actually uh, uh, achieved or attained their independence from the European powers that were colonizing them. There was less European uh, military or security influence there. You had issues of corrupt governments in many countries, some that are still corrupt. That is that is something that will drive people towards uh, extremist ideology. You know, they, they look at a corrupt government as perhaps being um, a lapdog, per se, of a Western power. So in a lot of this, it's poor governance is, is part of the issue. Look at Tunisia, for instance, the country where the Arab Spring originated, seemed like a model for what should have happened across the Middle East. People come together to overcome their troubles, but they still have terrorism. So where is it coming from? Tunisia is a poor country, uh, and there is, uh, you know, and again, in Tunisia, in the Middle East, I mean, it, with what they have done uh, since the Arab Spring is remarkable. Uh, the election of a, a, democratic, a democratically elected government, it's remarkable, but they do have uh, that segment of the population, it's poor, it's uneducated, it, it feels disenfranchised from the government. That's why Tunisia, uh, as a nation, there are more foreign fighters from Tunisia in Iraq and Syria with ISIL than any other country. Uh, estimates, best estimates, at 3,000. About 500 of those fighters just in the last several months have returned to Tunisia. So they they were hardened uh, in Iraq and Syria. Now they're back in Tunisia. Let me ask you this. Is Europe under threat here? ISIS has said it will attack European states. Can it? I mean, the terrorists are already active in Libya just across the sea from Italy. Can they use that? Yes. Is Europe under threat uh, of terrorist attack that is ISIS-inspired? Yes. Um, ISIS right now, like Boko Haram, their focus is on maintaining control of the territory that they have. And in the last several weeks, they've seen a number of losses as far as territory in Iraq and in Syria. 
ISIS will not likely uh, send sails into Europe to fight, at least not in the near term, but they will rely, as you've seen in other attacks, they'll rely on um, motivating other individuals who are already in Europe to conduct those attacks. They, they, they said so much in September of last year, calling on extremists all over the world, come fight with us in Iraq and Syria. If you can't travel to Iraq and Syria, then kill the Westerners in the cities and towns that you live in. If you have a bomb, use a bomb. If you have a gun, use a gun. If not, use a knife. Um, so this is worldwide call to kill foreigners in their own countries. All right, we're going to take a short break right now. When we're back, we'll continue talking to Martin Reardon, former FBI agent, counterterrorism expert. We'll discuss the reasons behind the Islamic State's successful social media campaign and how to put an end to it. Stay with us. September the 8th, 1941, marked the start of the siege of Leningrad. German troops surrounded the city and subjected it and its people to an incessant barrage of shelling and bombing. There was soon a severe shortage of food and medicines. Before long, death by starvation had become a regular event. I Korsakova, Tatiana, I'm 78 Два года из этих лет я прожила в блокадном Ленинграде. Если я закрою глаза, то я сразу вспомню эту затененную комнату. На столе коптилка, в середине комнаты печурка, буржуйка, на ней что-то варится. Но пахнет невкусно. Я знаю, что это, это столярный клей. Но Очень хочется кушать. 125 грамм хлеба в день. И все. И больше ничего не было. Мама для того, чтобы как бы чуть-чуть подкормить семью, ходила к линии фронта. И там под пулями с двух сторон она собирала несжатый овес, приносила домой. А мне говорили, таточка, очищай. И я своими маленькими пальчиками чистила этот овес. Когда наступила весна, то мы ходили смотреть э, на мостик фонтанки. И с моста мы видели, как плывут трупы. И почему-то дети, вот и я в том числе, не пугались ни этих трупов, не вызывали они у нас отвращения. Вот как некая данность, вот, в которой мы присутствуем. Но моя сестренка которая родилась в августе 41 -го года, она умирала. Я видела, как подергивались ее ручки, как закатывались глазки. Но бабушка, она где-то в каких-то уголках, в чайных коробках нашла несколько чаинок, заварила чай, несколько крупиц песка и вот эти заваренным чайком отпоила мою сестренку, отогрела ее растирая варежкой, сестренка выжила. Не могу себе целиком представить, насколько тяжело ей было. Я знаю, что это было очень трудно. Я очень его уважаю, тем более за то, что после всего пройденного она была очень спортивной, у нее огромное количество жизненных достижений. Она вырастила троих детей, еще и потом меня воспитала, за что я очень благодарен. Я думаю, чаще всего мне бабушка говорила про то, как голодно ей было в те годы. Особенно, когда ну, я ребенок, сижу за столом, не хочу что-то есть, потому что невкусно, или еще что-нибудь в этом роде. Бабушка также рассказывала про директиву Гитлера, которая была им подписана уже, по-моему, после установления блокады о том, что город должен быть стерт с лица земли и при любых условиях не должно остаться никого из населения.
back with former FBI agent, counter-terrorism expert Martin Reardon, talking about the spread of the Islamic State and its ideology across the region. Um, for instance, in Libya, Western forces try to help solve local problems, and now there is terrorism growing every day there. While coalition planes attack Islamic State, the bomb also, bombs also pound cities with civilians in them. Destruction, civilian losses, doesn't that breed more terrorism? Well, it does, and I, I, I think you know what you saw with, with the Arab Spring, and this this has been a problem for for decades in the Middle East, where you had certain governments, uh, autocratic, corrupt, uh, maintaining uh, a dictatorial uh, regime in those governments, um, the people revolted. Uh, when those governments, though, were in control, they, for the most part, kept the extremist bottled down brutally but they kept them bottled down i think with the arab spring what you saw uh and, and and even going as far back as the uh u.s invasion of iraq in 2003 when you start doing orchestrated regime change and taking out these strong albeit brutal leaders it opens it up for there's a vacuum there and that vacuum is going to be filled by somebody who wants the power um you know and 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 in libya it's just a huge amount of space that is ungoverned. Uh, you actually, in Libya, you have two governments in two different, neither of which is, is, has complete legitimacy, um, occupying two different uh, capitals. It's, it's a recipe for disaster there. You're seeing the same thing in Yemen now. Ungoverned space is just a breeding ground for extremist organizations. But what I'm asking is this, does the West make itself a primary target for terror by meddling in local affairs, in other countries' local affairs? Yes, uh, uh, you know, of course they do, and, and that's been the motivation and the stated reason by a number of these organizations for attacking Western uh, countries, because of their meddling in what they consider to be their own affairs. But how does terror become a local problem in the West? I mean, the quality of life is much higher in the United States or Europe, but educated young people become terrorists too. We see this every day. I, it, it's, it's a number of different things. You know, in, in, in any country, you could talk in the United States, in the United Kingdom, uh, all throughout Europe, you are going to have uh, immigrant populations who feel that they are disenfranchised. The younger people, teenagers, young adults, those are the more vulnerable because they take that disenfranchisement, um, they can take it to a violent level. They would, and, and now with social media, the internet, with, 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 with smartphones, with Twitter, it's so easy to radicalize people and use social media for that purpose and to recruit people. So this is, this is disenfranchised communities in this country Mm -hmm. And it's the use of social media. Now, with the Internet and social media, it's become easier for extremists to recruit. But shouldn't it also be easier to track them as well? So why are they winning the social media campaign? Well, when it comes to social media, I mean, it's as far as when they are using it. But I think there has been many discussions over the years about the government getting involved with social media and using that as a counter narrative. The problem with governments being involved in a counter-narrative is, is people automatically put that as propaganda. Well, of course the government is going to say that as propaganda. What is probably preferable for that counter-narrative um, is to use, or for religious leaders, if this is a religious uh, agenda you're trying to address, um, academic leaders, non-government entities, uh, for them to, to actually push out that counter-narrative. Exactly how easy is it to join ISIS? Do you just like board a plane to Turkey and cross the border into Syria and, and then what? Like do you email them at first? W what? Like what happens? The recruiting site, it's done a number of different ways. Uh, there are chat rooms on the internet that people will go on to. Uh, they will be married up with members of ISIS or ISIS recruiters. Uh, to talk about what it's like, why you should come here, what they're fighting for, and to give them ideas how to do it. For, for instance, uh, you know, and of course the, the common route into Iraq and Syria is through Turkey. Um, a number of European countries now are tracking travel to Turkey direct 
So there's a securities route that is taken, going through a number of different countries, crossing in from Romania, going into Turkey. So it's, 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 it's not difficult to get to Iraq or Syria to fight with ISIS. When you were with FBI, you monitored the international terror watch list. Now, a lot of recent attacks were actually perpetrated by those watched by authorities. And I mean, the Tsar Knives in Boston, the Charlie Hebdo attackers, the leader of ISIS, Abu Bakr al-Baghdad, was actually detained in a U.S. prison. So what's the use of this terror watch list? Well, for the United States, the purpose for coming up with the watch list initially was to either... Uh, prevent or limit entry into the United States by aviation means. That was the whole purpose, it, it, is if somebody to say that this person is a, a known or suspected terrorist, therefore they cannot get onto an aircraft that's coming into the United States, or they may be supporting terrorism in some aspect, um, or it hasn't been determined that there's a definite connection, so they're on a watch list where, or secondary screening where they're allowed to come into the United States but then uh, subjected to it questionings or perhaps their uh, luggage is uh, searched or, or wherever they're going, that, that law enforcement jurisdiction is notified. So there is a, a, a real purpose for the watch list, uh, but that really it pertains to people traveling into the United States. Baghdadi was watch listed, but that didn't restrict for the United States for the United States that didn't restrict his travel anywhere in the Middle East. Also, a lot of ISIS leaders came from Camp Bukha, where al-Baghdadi was interned. Um, I'm just wondering, did it end up helping them build a network instead of neutralizing, neutralizing them? It, it, it did. I think it, it did a couple of things. And you see the same thing um, in the West, in Europe, in the United States, um, with prisons. Prisons, people of like mind will, will come together uh, they'll talk about, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll basically form bonds there, get hardened. You see this with, with uh, gang members. They go to prison, they become more hardened. When they go out, they're accepted into a gang, um, and then they go right back in. Same thing, and this, this is what happened with the detainees in Iraq in a large extent. And you're right, Baghdadi and most of his senior leadership, the Iraqi leadership, had that one thing in common. They were all in prison together, and that's where they formed those bonds. So yes, that did help to radicalize or further radicalize them, but they were already fighting when they were put in prison. You know, there, was all, there was already a degree of radicalization. It was just hardened, and then they formed this bond while they were there. Now, these terror acts have a strong theatrical aspect to them. They are a media event, executions of Coptic Christians on the beach, destroying priceless ancient artifacts. Terrorism is always about the reaction that follows. Isn't extensive media coverage giving them exactly what they want? Well, it is. Uh, that's what they want. And, and that's one of the reasons why Boko Haram... Uh, gave Bayat to, uh, to ISIL was to get that additional attention. Um, but the alternative would be to ban media from uh, putting any of this on. I mean, this is news. This is what the public, not only what they want to see, but they need to know. They need to know what the, uh, uh, what the threat of, of, say, ISIL is. And, and, and that actually, when you look at the coalition that was put together, last uh, summer and fall to fight ISIL, both the, the uh, Arab countries and the Western countries that put that coalition together, this, this really started because of the, uh, the starting with the Foley uh, execution video, when people saw the horror of this, um, you know, that's really what drove a lot of these countries to join the coalition. So that, that actually, and, and that's what ISIL wanted. They wanted to pull the West into a fight there. It just hasn't been a ground fight like they were hoping. Now, destroying libraries and ancient statues, centuries of Islamic scholarship, Arabic writings, that's not really lives of people. Um, who is that going to frighten? And also, ideology aside, people are always people. Do some of those looted artifacts pop up in the black market here and there? Will some of them show up in the black market? Certainly they will, uh, but I think what, you, what, what ISIL is trying to do by destroying these artifacts is take away everything that goes away from their, their version of Islam. 
Uh, so anything that, that, that counters that, they are destroying. You saw the same thing in Afghanistan in the 1930s, or I'm sorry, in the 1990s with the Taliban, when they, when they took down anything that, uh, you know, the, the, the statues of Buddha that were there, anything that was contrary to their version of, of Islam, they destroyed. You've seen the same thing with ISIL, whether it's people or, uh, or cultural uh, areas. Now, Al-Qaeda and Islamic State, they have made sure everybody knows not to associate one with the other. Where does this animosity between terrorists come from? Does ISIS get more money from sponsors and now it's more popular? Is that the biggest problem here? ISIL's brand is a little bit too extreme. It's way too extreme for Al-Qaeda. Uh, and, 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 and as bad as Al-Qaeda is, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's when they're saying that ISIL is too extreme for them. And again, it's just this, this large-scale massacres, uh, the, 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 the kidnappings, uh, the indiscriminate killing. Uh, it's, this, is, this is what pushed ISIS and, uh, and Al-Qaeda apart. And really quickly, could terrorists actually destroy each other eventually? Well, you have terrorist organizations that are fighting right now. Uh, Jabhat al-Nusra and ISIS are fighting. Uh, so, uh, you know, and, and, and every terrorist organization has a life cycle. They, have a, they, 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 they are created for, a, for one reason or another. Uh, they come to their, 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 their rise, and then they start to go down, and they cease to exist. Somebody will fill that void when you have ungoverned space. ISIS can be destroyed... In, in, you know, let's, if ISIS were to be destroyed just in the next few weeks in Iraq and Syria, uh, unless that space is governed, somebody is going to fill the void, whether that's uh, Jabhat al-Nusra or another terrorist organization. It, it doesn't matter. Somebody's going to fill that void until the space is governed. Thank you so much for this interesting insight, Mr. Reardon. We were talking to FBI counterterrorism veteran Martin Reardon, discussing the growing clout of the Islamic State and where it stems from, how to stop it. That's it for this edition of Sophie & Co. I will see you next time.